Thank you very much. I'm uh, very happy to have been invited to chair this session. Um, I have worked in HIV and TB in South Africa and in Malawi, and I'm very happy that we have that we start off with a TB topic, and then we are going into um, very special populations within the HIV field. So um, I would like to um, welcome Esther Casas, a medical doctor um, who has worked for MSF for a long time um, to lead us through the nine month short course in the TB treatments. Yeah, good morning to everybody and good day to everybody online. Um, yeah, well, this morning um, I'm going to share with you the interim results of this two prospective studies that are looking at implementation of short course to treat multidrug resistant TB in two settings in Swaziland and Uzbekistan. So why is this relevant? If today any of you is diagnosed with multidrug resistant TB, your physician will give you a cocktail of drugs for at least 20 months. And amongst these, eight of these ones are going to be on injectables. So, we had results a couple of years ago from Bangladesh challenging that and letting us know that actually it might be possible to treat multidrug resistant TB in a for a shorter duration with also a cocktail of drugs, shortening the intensive phase with injectables and with a still the same drugs that we are classically using first and second line drugs. These people, they showed from an observational cohort analysis that after nine months of treatment, the success rate was 88%. So MSF chose to look at that a bit more in depth and to increase the evidence in specific populations in settings where there is high prevalence rate of second line drug resistance and in settings where the HIV prevalence is also very high. So we go to Uzbekistan where MSF is working since 2003, supporting comprehensive TB care in Karakalpakstan and where the rates of MDR TB prevalence, I'm not going to go through all these numbers, but you can see that they are quite high, quite impressive. And in Swaziland, we are working there since 2010. Swaziland, this is a small country bordering Mozambique and South Africa, has also the highest HIV prevalence rates in the world, and not only that, the highest TB incidence rates in the world as well. And not only that, more than 80% of the cases that we are going to see with TB are HIV co-infected. So we are going to look how we can improve the treatment for these patients with multidrug resistant TB. The object, both the studies, they have the same, they share the same objective. We aim to describe effectiveness and safety following treatment completion of this regimen in patients with MDR-TB with and without HIV co-infection. Any patient that is diagnosed with MDR-TB and that consented is included in the study. If patients they had any contraindications to the drugs, XDR-TB or other resistant patterns, severe renal insufficiency, abnormalities in the electrocardiogram, or in the case of Uzbekistan, additional exposure or previous exposure to second line drugs were excluded from the study. So in summary, these are two independent prospective single arm cohort studies. So Uzbekistan is aiming at including 147 patients in three sites. Swaziland is looking at including 120 HIV co-infected patients in two sites. The study in Uzbekistan started in September 2013. The study in Swaziland in January 2014. They both got approval from the ERBs in country and in MSF, and they are both working with independent drug safety monitoring boards. So the time of the analysis, the moment of the analysis at the end of December 2014, we see that in Uzbekistan we enrolled 119 patients. Of them, 14 withdrawn a posteriori from the study. In Swaziland, 61 were enrolled in the study, four of them withdrawn later on. Why we withdrawn or we had to withdraw patients from the study? Mostly because they showed different patterns of resistance from the criteria. So we saw some patients that had confirmed drug sensitive TB, patients with polydrug resistant TB, patients that showed additional second line drug resistance with XDR TB or extreme drug resistant TB, and in Swaziland, one patient with raw consent. 
We have a look quickly at the baseline demographic data. I put them together just for the sake of the presentation. We do not aim to compare results. Out in Uzbekistan, out of the 105 patients, we can see 50% male, and the median age was 30 years old. In Swaziland, out of the 57 patients enrolled at that moment, 40% were male, 35 years old. The, the, the BMI body mass index median was around 20 in both cases, and to highlight, three out of four patients in the Swaziland cohort were HIV co-infected. To also note that amongst the registration group, more than 70% of the cases in both cohorts were new cases. And having a look at the closer, a closer look at the HIV subgroup, we can see basically that the baseline demographic data is the same in the HIV subgroup than in the overall group in Swaziland. And looking at the interim outcomes at the end of 2014, in Uzbekistan, there were still on treatment 66 patients. Out of them, 35 were still on intensive phase, that means on injectables. 24 patients had documented successful outcomes, two died, three patients failed, and 10 patients were documented lost of follow up. In Swaziland, out of the 57 patients enrolled, 39 at the moment of the analysis were still on treatment, 21 of them on intensive phase, 10 patients were cured, six died, two failed. And again, having a look at closely at the HIV subgroup analysis, what this revealed to us is that all the patients that died in Swaziland were HIV-related deaths. <laughs> So why do patients die? In Swaziland, as I said, we had HIV TB related deaths, advanced HIV TB with a case suspected of cryptococcal meningitis encephalopathy related to later stage of HIV AIDS, two cases related to advanced MDR TB, and two cases with liver failure. In Uzbekistan, one of the deaths was related to the MDR TB process, another one not. Let's have a look at the culture conversion. And we see that in all the groups in Uzbekistan and in Swaziland, and including the HIV subgroup cohort, at four months, we have more than 90% of the patients converting culture. A closer look at the analysis at month two in Uzbekistan, we saw that already 73% of the patients had culture converted, as I said, at month two. In terms of toxicity, we still see a number of side events. The most of them in Uzbekistan are mild grade one, mostly nausea and vomiting and headache and dizziness. And in Swaziland, also a number of adverse events, the most of them mild also grade one, mostly also nausea and vomiting and arthralgias and minor autotoxicity. And a few number of cases documented with severe advanced events. Another one of the concerns, or one of the main concerns of this regimen is the cardiotoxicity and the prolongation of the interval QT in the electrocardiogram that eventually might lead to very, uh, might lead to very severe arrhythmias. So we looked at that, and in both, in both the studies, there were monitoring with electrocardiogram in a regular basis for all patients. So what we see is that at two and four weeks, the median increase of this corrected QT was less than 20 milliseconds in all cases, in, all, in both programs, I mean. And then there is a number of patients that had an increase of more than 60 milliseconds. And in one case in Swaziland, we documented an absolute uh, QTC of more than 500 milliseconds at two weeks. This patient had also uh, documented electrolyte abnormalities, corrected, and he could resume treatment. So in conclusion, we know that we need, I'm not saying anything new probably, we need shorter, safer, and more tolerable regimens to treat multidrug resistant TB. These outcomes indicate that there is early culture conversion in this regimen. As expected, we have, we have some failures. We have a challenge in terms of loss to follow up and age-related deaths, indicating that there are components of the program that we have to improve and to work on further. There is still, this is not yet a regimen that is toxic-free. 
And then we have to think about the next steps. Obviously, when it comes to the studies, we want to look at the final outcomes of these regimens in these two settings. We want to look at relapse rates as part of the effectiveness, ass effectiveness assessment. And when it comes to TV, it seems that there is some light at the end of the tunnel with new drugs becoming available. And we have the MSF commitment to continue on the fight against tuberculosis. And this is actually great news, and I have the pleasure to show you a couple of very nice initi initiatives. I can only give a couple of hints, but this is related to randomized clinical trialing, several new regimens that combine new drugs. With all that, I would just like to thank the teams in the field, the ministries of health, mainly the patients, and to you all for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for keeping to time. Um, <clears throat> we are going to take a couple of questions. They are all going to be technical questions because there is a discussion at the end. So if anybody wants any questions or clarifications, then Nathan. Hi, thanks, Esther. Nathan from WHO. Um, did you have any information on antiretroviral therapy status or immune status uh, for yeah. the patients? For the, Swaziland. Hmm. for the HIV court in Swaziland, all the, it's included in the protocol also and in the management of treatment, all the patients, they are either on antiretrovirals and or they start soon after treatment, antiretroviral treatment, and we are looking also at response of the treatment baseline if they have already been there with viral loads and so on. This analysis I cannot yet share. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much.